Good afternoon and welcome to the Virginia Virtual Farm to Table program. My name is Lena Wen. I'm the 4-H Extension Agent for Fauquier County. Uh, the purpose of this program is to highlight Virginia grown produce and livestock that are raised on farms across the Commonwealth and demonstrate how to create a delicious and nutritious meal with highlighted ingredients. This educational program highlights Virginia agriculture, community nutrition, and farm to table connections and is brought to you by Virginia Cooperative Extension, which is an educational outreach program of Virginia's land grant universities, Virginia Tech, and Virginia State University. Virginia Cooperative Extension's educational programs are delivered through a network of faculty at these two universities, 108 county and city offices, 11 agricultural research and extension centers, and six 4-H educational centers. So I encourage you all to participate in your local VCE programs if you haven't already. Um, today's session is a special edition of this series. We're going to be doing some fun pairing today. So we're going to start off with Tim Mize, who is our Ag and Natural Resources Extension Agent for Fauquier County. And he's going to tell us a little bit about raising lamb. Then April Payne, who is the FCS Agent for Spotsylvania and Stafford Counties. She's going to show us how to make lamb chili featuring a Virginia red wine. And then Beth Chang, who is an an analogy extension specialist will tell us about growing grapes and making wine in Virginia. And then she's going to tell us a little bit about pairing wines with different foods. Um, so I'm going to serve as the Q&A monitor. Um, so if you have any questions as the presenters present their material, you can go ahead and type that into the Q&A box and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can at the end of the session. So I will go ahead and hand it over to Tim. So uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for tuning in. So as Lena said, I'm the livestock extension agent, and also I'm a producer of lambs and beef. So I've only got 10 minutes to try to give you an overview of what, what goes on with lamb production. And so I'm, I'm kind of going to hit the high points, and most of the pictures are from my farm. So hopefully they make sense, at least they do to me. So I'll try to explain them as we go through. Okay, Beth, next picture, slide. So uh, why do we raise sheep? So there are some good and the bad. They're extremely efficient converters when we especially compare them to other ruminants. Um, they're about 26% more efficient than cows. That has a lot to do with their maintenance requirements and the fact that we also can get wool and sometimes milk. Um, they're great weed control. So they won't just concentrate on grasses or forages like that. They'll also eat lots of forbs and weeds. One of the big things I think that attracts people to them is they're small. So even the biggest ewe is gonna be under 200 pounds. So you know, as a 1200 pound cow or 200 pound ewe, there's a lot of difference there. And when you have to buy equipment, everything is on a smaller version. And oftentimes there's less necessary, but we'll talk about some other things that aren't. Like I said earlier, they can produce meat, wool and milk. And so some of your favorite cheeses, feta and all comes from, from sheep's milk. So um, there, there are not a lot of sheep dairies in the United States, but there are, are some. They are very tolerant of a wide range of climates, but I'm gonna qualify that one area that wool sheep don't do very well in is the humid south. And so we'll talk about some hair sheep that have sort of filled in that area, um, but you'll find sheep all around the world and they, they fit every niche. They are very tolerant of drier areas. And so their water requirement, they're very efficient with water. So that's one thing that makes them very useful in uh, some other areas of the world. And the great thing is they complement other grazers. And here I'm basically talking about cattle. So we can pretty much one, one cow and one sheep and not really change our stocking rate just because of the variation in how they're, they're grazing. Now, the problems with sheep, and these are three big ones. One is predators. They are small, lambs are little. We're talking, you know, triplets, three pounds a piece. So they're sort of like a, a chicken nugget for a coyote. Um, and we have to make sure that we're taking care of that. Even birds of prey can, can feed on lambs. So that's an issue that we have to be aware of. Parasites, sheep and goats are affected by a blood sucking parasite um, as opposed to something like cattle. And so they get anemic and there's a lot of resistance built up to wormers. And so that's an issue that we deal with. And we have some management and right now we're currently selecting genetically to find these uh, animals that are resistant and also resilient. And then fencing. It's pretty easy to keep 
cattle in, it's a little harder to keep sheep in, but they're easier than keeping goats in. So I guess we'll put them in the middle, but it takes a fairly decent fence. Luckily with all the new electric fencing options out there, sheep production has gotten a lot easier in that regard. Okay, Beth. So I, I thought we'd start because I get a lot of questions about this um, terminology on sheep. So they are ruminants, which means that basically they have a four compartment stomach where there's a sort of vat fermentation going on. There's bacteria and fungi living in there. And that's what allows them to break down forages. And <clears throat> that's why they're so efficient, just like cows. Um, we call sheep generally anything that is over a year and usually that is lamb. So we're, when we talk about sheep, we're generally talking about the mature side of the animal. Lamb is generally anything under a year. And you'll see that stretched out a little bit on either side. But um, when we look at carcasses and for it to actually grade as lamb, it has to have what's called a break joint. So there's still, we don't have ossification throughout the, the whole carcass. So that's part of what they look for when they're grading. Yearling, pretty much as it sounds, that's uh, an animal that's between one and two years. So that middle ground. Mutton, everybody's probably heard of mutton and I'm sure it's not favorable. Um, especially if your grandfather or great grandfather was stationed in, in Europe during World War II, they probably came home and said they would never eat another, another lamb and mainly because they were feeding on mutton. But uh, mutton has a very strong flavor. Um, it depends on how you like it. It's very gamey. So um, I guess it's sort of a, a choice. Use that's a female that has lambs. And then you'll hear us also talk about ewe lambs and that's, that's a, a a lamb that is a year old that is just lamb, so she's young. Ram is an intact male. You'll also hear people refer to them as bucks. And if you, you've got any Englishman or Irishman around, they're gonna call them tups. And then a weather is a castrated male. So that's generally in this country what we're eating, although um, lamb has the ability to, to, since they finish so quickly, which we'll talk about in a second, we don't castrate them all the time. Next slide. Okay, so I thought I'd talk a little bit sort of the life cycle. And up above, you'll see that uh, German saying, proverb, you can feed 10 sheep where a cow would starve to death. And in some regards, that's very true because of their maintenance requirements. I just want to make sure, I know everybody grew up and probably heard that goats could live off 10 cans, and that's not true. On a per pound basis, these small ruminants have higher nutrient requirements, but their, their, their very selection and um, their efficiency is so great that they can do a lot off forages. And generally in Virginia and across the United States, forages is the main part of their diet, making up over 80%. So, and in some areas it's even higher than that. And generally the only time that will supplement these sheep, of course, is if we're having in some kind of issue like a drought where we need to, but we'll do that pre-breeding because one of the things we look for in sheep is to have twins. And so we're trying to get them to release as many eggs as they can. And also the last trimester. And that's because if you picture this ewe, she's got a, a pretty big rumen because she's eating grass. And then if you picture there's also three babies in there, that rumen can't get to full capacity. And so oftentimes we'll have to give them some kind of supplementation that's a little denser to help them to uh, get through and meet their needs. And so generally um, sheep will graze about seven hours a day and the rest of the time they'll spend ruminating. Um, so they'll, they'll graze, it depends um, on the season. They may graze early or late or depending on temperatures during the middle of the day. The great thing about uh, lambs is, is that in about five months we can finish them. So if you've got good forages, good milking ewes and good growthy lambs, uh, from the time they're born in about five months we can get them up to market weight. And, and that can be speeded up on either end too. And the other great thing about it is uh, lambs can finish on one season in grass. So if we're lambing in the springtime, um, by fall, we'll have those lambs that are averaging somewhere between 90 and 120 pounds. So they're ready to come off and, and be harvested right then. So that, that's sort of a benefit and, and that's a turnaround quickly. Whereas if we're looking at calves and we're talking about marking weights, market, um, market weight, we're talking about 24 months. A um, little shorter on the feed lot, a little longer on grass fed. Okay, next. So uh, this is just a picture. The other ones you saw were some of my sheep too. This is Katahdin ewes. These are actually hair sheep. And there's a couple of, of crossbred uh, wool sheep out there, but they're actually following behind the cows. And so there was, this was a early snow and uh, they're actually um, feeding on leftover 
um, vines and stuff in there and picking out anything that's green. And so they're in the middle of, of gestation. So their demands are pretty low and they're gleaning through and they're all, they also have access to hay. So, but they're out there cleaning up the field and they followed the cows through. And that's another benefit. The sheep are gonna eat what the cows didn't. So we're sort of on that same piece of ground, we're harvesting um, much more pounds per acre by utilizing two species that are grazing a little differently. Next slide. Um, and I just wanna say the background that you see there is actually from um, a research farm, Virginia Tech from the uh, 1950s. So that's just sort of a difference how sheep have changed. I probably should have put a picture of, of what a modern Hampshire looks like, but that's some of the older, older Hampshires. Um, they were pretty efficient and finished at pretty light weights. Uh, one thing I wanna say is that um, sheep are seasonally anestrous for the most part, which so a cow will cycle every 21 days pretty much throughout the year. Most sheep breeds will only come into heat in the fall and lamb in the spring. And so they, they are affected by decreasing daylight. So that's, that's sort of a, a hampers our marketing because you know, we really can't get these, these sheep to have. And if we're finishing these lambs off fairly quickly, they're all getting done sort of at the same time. And that puts a lot of market pressure on. And also if you're direct marketing, it, it really is hard to space these things out to where you can have um, animals being harvested around the year. Now, that being said, there are some breeds that will breed out of season. Um, the issue is though, anytime we get out of that fall breeding, we lose fertility and we lose the amount of lambs that we're gonna get. And so that's, it's a trade-off. It takes about 145 days. And of course I said earlier, we are looking for twins. So um, we want all of our ewes to twin. They won't all do it. We'll get a few triplets and we'll get some singles, but uh, we're hoping that we can get two lambs out of, out of each ewe. And the pictures that you see there at the upper right, that is, um, that's lambing in a barn and that's what we call a jug. And so depending on the season early on in the year, we bring them inside because lambs are small and they have very little brown fat and they, they just can't take extreme weather in those first few days. And also because they have more than one, we're trying to give that you time to, to mother up and make sure everybody knows who everybody is. But on the bottom, you'll see my Katahdin flock and they actually lamb in April. And so they lamb on pasture and we lamb in a pretty big one to make sure that everybody can get away and that you can keep those lambs together um, as he's trying to mother up. And so, you know, it's, it's the wool sheep are generally lambing in February and the hair sheep are lambing in April. Okay, next slide. So uh, real quick, I'm running out of time here, but there's a bunch of breeds uh, in Virginia and in the United States, but only relatively few of any number. The wool sheep that you see at the bottom there are Dorsets. Um, they might be, they're probably second. Uh, we have a lot of black faced sheep. Suffolk would be the main one and there's a lot more hamps. But what's really taken over the sheep industry and not just in Virginia, but across the United States is the uh, hair sheep that you see at top. So the hair sheep um, don't need to be sheared and wool doesn't have much value unless you're a very fine wool breed like a Rambouillet. And so there's an expense you don't have to worry about. They shed just like cows. They're more parasite resistant as a group and more foot rot resistant, which are, are two issues that we have with sheep. And they will breed out of season. So that's one of those breeds that can actually uh, get bred in the spring and lamb in the fall. So that uh, breed has the biggest push of any breed in the United States lately. More have been registered than any other breed. And as I wind up, next slide. Uh, I just want to say that actually a big part of the market and a lot of the lambs you see are actually what we call club lambs. And so these are projects for youth. And uh, you can sort of think of this as your traveling, uh, you know, softball team, baseball team, soccer team. These kids spend the whole summer with these projects showing all across the state. Um, and these are sort of the, the thoroughbred of lambs. They have very specific requirements. These are not their mothers are not used that we're gonna turn out and, and graze corn stalks, they just won't make it. These are high octane animals, um, but this is a big part of our sheep market. And this has really grown in the last 10 years. Um, so, you know, if you're showing lambs or, and the same as with steers and hogs, um, these kids spend a lot of time and there's a lot of work that goes into a project like this. Um, but this makes up a big part of our, our sheep flock in Virginia actually. And so oftentimes what you're seeing is, is uh, a sheep flock started because someone had a kid in 4-H 
And next thing you know, they end up with 50 U's. And so that's sort of how things get started in the sheep business. Um, I didn't talk about taste, but I will real quick so that April uh, and Beth will know. Um, the black faced sheep tend to have a little bit gamier taste and the hair sheep tend to be a little milder. So it sort of depends on where you're at, but there's a lot of variation in breeds and a lot of variation within breeds. And of course, depending on how we finish them. So um, if you ever had something you thought was a little gamey, don't give up. Um, and eat American lamb. You're going to find the New Zealand and the Australian lamb is probably a little more gamey depending on what you've been eating. All right, Lena. All right, I'll queue up your video, April. If you have anything to say about it, you can go ahead and do that. Okay, great. Thank you. So, um, you know, of course, if you can locally source the lamb, that's probably one of the best ways to get that awesome um, meat because it, we do have a lot of local farms where we can get lamb from. So, you know, that's something certainly to do. And so this video is going to be about a delicious lamb chili that I made. And um, it's, of course, geared up for chili season. So please, if you can try it, I certainly advise that you do. Um, one thing that I learned about this though is I used half a bottle of wine and that might have been a tad too much. So maybe at one cup, give that a try and uh, otherwise enjoy this video. It's really good. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me and uh, my information you can certainly get. It's uh, A-R-P-A-Y-N-E at bt.edu is my email. Thank you for joining me. My name is April Payne and I'm the FCS Extension Agent for Spotsylvania and Stafford Counties. And tonight I'm really excited because we're going to be making a slow cooker lamb chili. So it's really unique because we're going to be using ground lamb, an assortment of delicious chili seasonings, and then also we're going to be using a half a bottle of red wine that I locally sourced from here in Virginia, and then also four different kinds of beans. So those four beans are packed with fiber and iron, and also it's gonna be packed with protein. This chili is a really, really wonderful array of different nutrients. And then I'm gonna also serve it with a salad to make sure that I'm getting my veggies in there. I'm making a slow cooker lamb chili adopted from Kroll's Corner, who is a dietitian and has wonderful resources and recipes online. The recipe is going to call for one pound of ground lamb, two tablespoons of garlic minced, two tablespoons of olive oil, one small red onion diced, one 15 ounce can of diced tomatoes, no salt, one medium salsa, thick and chunky, a half a bottle of wine, four tablespoons of the taco sauce, two tablespoons of green and two tablespoons of red, a half a cup of chili seasoning, one 15 ounce can of cannelli beans, one can of dark red kitty beans, one can of pinto beans, one can of black beans, and one can of yellow corn. This recipe is great for using up all those spices we have in our cabinets. So the easy chili seasoning recipe is going to be two tablespoons of chili powder, one tablespoon of cayenne, one tablespoon of coriander, one tablespoon of cumin, one tablespoon of garlic powder, one tablespoon of granulated sugar, one tablespoon of onion powder, a half a tablespoon of ground mustard and a half a tablespoon of white pepper and you mix it all together. All right, so I'm going to wash my hands for 20 seconds. And it's really important to get in between those fingers and around your hands, a little bit up your wrists. And it's nice to sing a song if you'd like to. There's certainly a few songs you can sing in your head to make sure it's 20 seconds. Um, but the other big thing is, I want to make sure all my surfaces are nice and clean, too. All right, so I'm starting out with a nice, clean surface, and I'm going to go ahead and show you all how to cut an onion. So there are different ways to cut onions, of course, but um, so I had this one left over from uh, the other night when I was making dinner, and I'm going to go ahead and use this one because it does call for a red onion, but truthfully, you can use any onion you want. But I want to show you a trick. So what I'm going to do is let's pretend this is clean and uh, it is clean, but let's pretend it's skin off. I'm going to go ahead and cut this onion straight down and then I will have half of an onion left, just like this one right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to cut the tail off right over here. So you're going to have a little tail on the onion. You cut that off, set that aside. 
And then I'm going to be working with a nice flat surface. You always want to work with a flat surface while you're cutting. So I'm going to take little slits straight up the onion, but I'm not going to cut all the way through. As I get closer, I want to make sure that I'm watching my thumb. I create like a puppy claw, watching my thumb and my fingers. And I'm just going to cut straight down. Now, there is a way that you, if you have a very sharp knife, you can cut towards you a little bit down, angling down. This helps it to make sure that they're evenly diced, but personally, I shy away from doing that. So if you want to, you can certainly give that a try. So again, I'm gonna create my little puppy claw. I'm gonna use my edge right on my board and I'm going to press straight down nice and hard. And it creates a nice diced onion. I'm gonna make sure my pan is nice and hot. So I sprinkle some water in there and if it starts to bead, I know my pan is nice and warm because I don't wanna add any kind of vegetables or meat to a cold pan. You actually wanna make sure it's preheated and I do that by just dabbing some water on it to make sure that it's good to go. All right, so I've got my lamb, my ground lamb and the onion and garlic all cooking right here. So I'm gonna add my meat mixture over here to the crock pot and after I add my meat mixture then I'm gonna add some diced tomatoes ideally no salt I'm gonna add one cup of medium salsa and thick and chunky that's the important one I'm gonna add half that bottle of red wine and then interesting I'm gonna be adding four tablespoons of taco uh, sauce so taco sauce is comes in red and green so I'm gonna add two tablespoons of red and two tablespoons of green that's a little unique to this recipe. And the chili seasoning I'll add after that. The chili seasoning is really great because I have so many spices in my cabinet, why not use them? So I was able to create this chili seasoning and it really helps save on money too, versus buying the packets. And you can cut your sodium because a lot of times you will notice those packets, interestingly enough, the pre-made packets have a lot of sodium in there. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rinse these beans. I'm gonna drain and rinse them and uh, there are four different types of beans. So that's wonderful. We've got kidney, black beans, pinto beans, and cannellini beans. Lots of beans. And then also my last but not least is the can of corn. And you can certainly use dry beans if you like. Please don't shy away from those. They're wonderful. I, for, for uh, convenience wise, I'm using the canned beans. Look at all those beautiful colors. And there we have it, a well-balanced, delicious meal. Thank you all for joining me. Yep, so, and I just wanna add that it was so easy to make. I mean, I just had a lot, a lot of that already in my pantry and just threw it all together. All right. Um, so, well, thanks, April. That was, uh, yeah, that was great. Uh, really, really great to um, see how this um, lamb dish came together. Um, and I saw the glass of wine at the end for the, for which leads perfectly into uh, nice. my part. So, um, so April um, and I worked together to pair um, this uh, lamb um, dish um, with, uh, with a wine. And uh, so today I'll be talking very quickly about many things, a little bit about wine production, a little bit about uh, wine production in Virginia, and then finally um, a little bit about food and wine pairing. So, oh, my things, here we go. Um, so um, for uh, those of you, uh, most of you probably already know, um, but uh, grapes are the starting material for, for wine, um, for most wines, I should say. There are other fruit wines out there. Um, and the grape that we use for making um, most of the wine um, throughout the world is the Vitus vinifera grape species. Um, within that species, there are tons of different um, varieties or cultivars. Um, and those are names that you recognize seeing the grocery store or the wine store or whatever, like Pinot Grigio, Merlot, um, Cabernet Sauvignon, as well as um, some cultivars that you might not be as familiar with, like Albarino or Sangiovese. 
those are all um, Vitis spinifera grapes. When we start talking about wine production, people can get a little bit confused about what makes a white wine white and a red wine red. Um, and there are two factors in this. The first is a uh, grape variety and the second is production method. So shown here on um, the left are two different grape varieties. We have Chardonnay on the top and then we have Cabernet Franc on the bottom. And you can see that Cabernet Franc has a white skinned grape. Um, and then Cabernet Franc is a red skinned grape. So white skinned grapes can only make white wine. There are uh, very few polyphenols in them to, um, so they really can't contribute color to the final wine product. However, the Cabernet Franc at the bottom, while it's a red skinned grape, if we removed that skin, and we'll talk about that in a second, we could technically make a white wine from a red skinned grape. So that's a little bit um, of, of a difference there between the two. Um, as far as that production side of things, here is, all, I have two diagrams here, one showing how white wine is typically made and another one showing how red wine is typically made. And you can see for this diagram for white wine, you know, we bring in the grapes, we, we harvest them. And then the key difference between white and red wine is when we press off separating out the grape pulp from the skins. So the grape pulp, it's juice, we separate out from the skins and the seeds. In white wine, we do this very uh, quickly to minimize skin contact time. Um, we, there's, no, there's really almost no color that's going to be extracted. If you do do some skin contact with white wine, sometimes you get a slight pinkish hue, or if you age it a bit, sometimes a little bit of an orange hue. But overall, we're, we're definitely in the realm of white-ish um, color. Um, so we, we tend, and we tend to not want color in our white wines. We also want our white wines to be very uh, clear. People like to see kind of a, uh, they don't tend to like seeing cloudiness in their white wine. So you can see in the next step here, we do a clarification step um, often. After that, we do our fermentation. So it's pressing and then fermenting. So for the fermentation stage, the only thing we add um, to wine, occasionally some nutrients are added, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, the, the key ingredient that we add is uh, the grapes themselves. And they, the grape berries contain sugars that are needed as food for the yeast. And the yeast is the only thing that we're, we're adding. And together, those make alcohol and release carbon dioxide. And then after that, we, uh, the fermentation is finished. Um, we then transfer the wine over into sometimes some aging containers and then finally into a bottle. In contrast, red wine, just uh, showing, we again um, have the grapes, we harvest them, and then we the, take the grapes into what is called a crusher to stemmer. So we separate um, out the, the this, the uh, grape buries themselves from a lot of the viney material that comes in, but we don't separate the grape pulp and juice from the grape skins and seeds yet. We just kind of lightly crush, release some of that, um, release some of that sugars from the grape berries. We add our yeast, we put it all together, we do our fermentation, and then after the fermentation is complete, we press off the skins and the seeds from the, the juice. And this is just because we don't want chunks of grape skin um, and seeds in our, in our glass of wine down the road. So a little bit about wine production in Virginia. Um, Virginia is a grape state for it. Um, we have about nine to 10 different wine regions um, around the state, uh, depending on which, which map you're looking at, and about seven AVAs or American viticulture areas. These are areas that are, are designated nationally, um, oops, sorry, as being recognized for um, having a distinctive uh, environment um, for that region um, for winemaking. Across the state, we have many different grape varieties planted. This figure is slightly dated, but you can see that um, we have several different white, uh, white skinned and uh, red skinned grape varieties throughout the state. The largest percentage in 2015 of plantings was Vidal Blanc. This is actually a hybrid grape, which means that it's a little bit uh, more conducive to our climate here. We have some disease pressures and some cold hardiness challenges in, in the higher regions in Shenandoah and such. And 
Vidal Blanc tends to um, do well with both of those things. Um, it's also, that's a white skinned grape. And then after that is Chardonnay, followed by Cab Franc, Merlot, and Cabernet Sauvignon. Very, very quick history of um, wine in Virginia. There were actually, um, there was actually a Virginia Wine Commission before there was a United States of America, which I think is, is a pretty cool fact. Um, Thomas Jefferson and some of our other founding fathers from the state uh, or, or, or uh, founding fathers um, of this country um, who, who were in Virginia, such as um, George Washington, planted vineyards in uh, the 1700s. To be honest, it does not appear, uh, historical records, it does not appear that they were uh, particularly successful uh, um, at doing this. They also had their minds on some other pretty big things, um, but it is neat to know that um, our, our lineage goes back that far. Fast forward about 200 years, um, the renaissance of wine uh, production in Virginia was around uh, the mid to late 70s. Started out with six wineries and a little less than 300 uh, acres of grapes. Um, in 1980, uh, the first version of the Virginia Farm Winery Act was passed. And this was a really landmark event because it allowed uh, wineries to distribute or sell their product right from where the wine was being produced, so right from the winery um, uh, tasting room type area, instead of having to go through a three-tiered distribution um, channel. So this really allowed um, wine production um, and agritourism to rise and become sustainable in our state. By 2005, uh, contributions from um, the wine, or wine industry to Virginia were estimated at $362 million. And in 2018, um, we have about 3,700 acres um, under vine. So that's an order of magnitude more than uh, the 70s. And at this point, it says here 280 wineries in 2018. Uh, at this point, we're at about 300 and economic impact is estimated at a little less, or sorry, a little more than $1.4 billion. So moving into the other half of this very short presentation, um, in order to talk about food and wine pairing, it's um, important to touch upon how we uh, perceive these, these flavors to determine whether we, we think it's a good pairing or not. So our perception of flavor is derived from multiple sensory modalities. I have here the five S's of wine perception and they're equally applicable to food. Um, the first one is sight. That is of course not a flavor, but many psychology studies indicate that our, our visual perception of foodstuffs, uh, things we eat and drink, um, influences uh, how we expect to perceive them, um, their flavor. And so if that's a mismatch, that can be a negative uh, thing. We've, we've, our expectation does not meet reality. That can be, be a letdown. Um, smell, um, we uh, don't actually, in basic food and wine pairing, don't talk a lot about smell, but the aromas of foods and wines is um, actually a really key um, contributor. We get a lot of our sense of overall flavor from uh, our sense of smell. And there's two different ways we smell. We smell orthonasally directly through our nose when we're swirling our wine or whatever. And then also retronasally as we imbibe, um, we get a little bit of uh, release um, as we exhale um, and also smell that way. For sip, we have two different modalities in our mouth that allow us to detect what we call flavor. We have taste, and that's what most people are most familiar with, uh, the tongue, taste buds, the senses of salty, sour, sweet, bitter, and umami, um, and those are important. In addition, we also have chemesthesis or mouthfeel or tactile receptors in our mouth that allow us to detect things like uh, astringency or um, uh, kind of a, a, a sandpaper perception in our mouth or else a burning sensation as well, like from uh, red hot chili peppers. Savor is that processing of all those stimuli, bringing them together, what is our overall impression of the flavor. And then the dollar signs um, for the final S, again, not a sensory modality, but uh, again, many studies show that um, if we perceive something to cost more, we are more likely to attribute better attributes for it. When we're looking at red versus white wine and wine tasting, people tend to assume it's uh, a, white, a red wine. 
So um, looking at um, food and wine pairing from the wine side of things, these are the common flavor co components that would be contributing to that, to that pairing. We have water, which contributes a viscous mouthfeel. Ethanol, which is often underrated um, in how much it contributes to our perception of flavor. Um, and ethanol is an interesting one because depending on its concentration, we actually detect uh, different things. Um, and ethanol has both a tactile and a taste sensation. So at the nine to 13% typical concentration in uh, wine, we will detect slight amounts of bitterness coming from the ethanol. And then also a little bit of heat, not as much as the heat that the burn that we get from like a shot of vodka, but there is a certain amount at nine to 13 and, and some wines get up towards 17, 18% that is a, a tactile sensation related back to the ethanol, the presence of ethanol. Glycerol is a negative, uh, a negligible contribution both in quantities in the wine and in uh, flavor compounds. Uh, acid is the big one in wine. Um, acids, we have uh, three different organic acids in wine um, that overall create this perception of sourness or refreshing uh, sensation, depending on the concentration. So I always say that the acid in wine is what separates it from just grape juice with alcohol, um, or one of the things that separate it from grape juice with, uh, with alcohol added. Um, that refreshingness of the acid really gives it some backbone. The acid makes us uh, salivate, it induces our salivary glands, this aids in digestion. Um, so that's why wines that are higher in acid can be really good for food and wine pairing. Sugars, even um, wines that are perceived to be dry on the palate can have up to 10 grams per liter of sugar, and we perceive that as sweet. And that can be a good balancing with the amount of acid in the wine, um, as well as the amount of uh, tannins. Um, and speaking of tannins, polyphenols are predominantly in red wine. They contribute that color, that sight that we find visually appealing, as well as mouthfeel, that astringency um, that we, we have in, in bigger red wines. Um, and that astringency can be uh, pleasant if paired with a really juicy steak um, or, or other types of meat, because meats have a lot of proteins in them and the tannins combine to the protein, decreasing that astringency effect. Um, polysaccharides and minerals are uh, pretty negligible. And then I think I've already talked about aroma a decent amount. As far as foundations of um, food and wine pairing, it, it, again, it, people tend to focus on the taste and tactile sensations. Um, so this diagram here is from Wine Folly. Um, if you're interested in learning more about wine um, from a wine connoisseur, wine appreciation perspective, it's, it's a really good website um, to, to gain more information. Um, so shown here are six um, different uh, uh, flavor attributes, all related to taste or mouthfeel that can be um, related back to the food, the wine, or both. And so you can see here something like that, that's only derived from food and it gives us a tactile perception. And the little blue lines here are showing that fat pairs well with spiciness, saltiness, acid, sweet, and bitter. So it pairs well with all the things. Um, in contrast, the next one to the left, bitter. Bitterness can be derived from both foods and from wine. It creates that tactile perception I was talking about. And while it pairs well with fat and salt and sweet, it does not pair well with acid and spiciness. So you don't want, um, if you have a really spicy dish, we're gonna shy away from things that could be really high in uh, tannins, really bold, like a Cabernet Sauvignon with, with the Mexican spices would probably clash and, and give us um, a, a negative overall impression. Uh, sweetness derived again from food and, wine, uh, food and wines and has a taste perception, pairs well with everything. Acid, um, uh, is derived from food and wine and gives us that sour perception, does not, again, go well with a lot of spiciness or a lot of bitterness. They kind of, kind of, uh, it's, it's um, too much. It overpowers um, uh, in, a, in a bad way. Um, then we have salt. Uh, salt is pretty much derived from food. It's a taste perception, pairs with everything. And then that spiciness, we pretty much covered it. Um, it's mostly derived from food. You can get, I think what they're alluding to here with, with spiciness is that heat. And as I mentioned, you can get that heat sensation also from uh, ethanol at higher concentrations and that's tactile. 
So a few um, general pairing tips. Um, these are kind of classic, uh, classic three. One is balance. So balancing the weight of the dish with the weight of the wine. So we tend to move from the light whites to the heavy reds. So vegetarian dishes up through seafood and some chicken dishes tend to be paired with whites um, of varying weights. Um, and then the reds tend to be reserved more for heavier chicken dishes up through other, other meats like uh, beef, lamb, um, uh, that sort of thing. Matching, an easy thing to do is to look to match the most prominent aspect of the wine to the most prominent aspect of the dish. Um, so this would be uh, a process called malolactic fermentation. These, these type of Chardonnays are often made in California, tend to pair well with buttery dishes. Um, so if you have like a, a pasta with a creamy sauce, that sort of thing, it would go really well. And then we seek congruent or complementary flavors, as you can see here on the right. A congruent pairing means many shared compounds. They have the example here, beef and mushroom going, they have a lot in common. And so if I was trying to pair beef um, and, uh, and especially it was beef with mushrooms with a wine, I might look towards like a French Pinot Noir that's known for kind of having like an earthy, um, earthy light to medium weight red wine. Um, we can also do complementary pairing where there's some shared compounds, but not a ton. But typically those are pairings we're, we're well aware of, tend to go well together, um, like ham and cheese. Um, so in this case, it's lime and coconut. So if I had a dish that had lime and coconut, I'd probably be looking towards a light to medium white wine, maybe with a little bit of residual sugar. Um, these would tend to be a good, a good match. And then finally, experiment and have fun. If you're interested in this, um, I really recommend just trying things from your liquor store. Um, people tend to move over time from sweet wine to dry wine, white to red, classic to emerging regions. Um, I also find it fun. Sometimes you decide to pick the food first, plan your, your meals for the week, and find some wine to fit in there with it. And it's sometimes fun to go in the opposite direction. While you're at the wine store, you find a few bottles and you decide to work backwards and pair your food to your wine. Just showing here an example of, you can find lots of these charts online, but this, if you're looking for specific examples of pairings, here's a good place to start. Um, uh, note that I don't think these things at the bottom are particularly hard to uh, match with. Um, just pick a light like, like Sauvignon Blanc or something like that. Um, and then finally, uh, just one more minute um, on today's pairing, which was a Virginia Cab uh, Cabernet Franc with this lamb chili. Um, so when April um, sent me the recipe and we were kind of going back and forth about things, you know, what, what I looked for um, in this when I'm looking over the, the recipe, I saw that the weight of the dish was um, medium, kind of hearty, uh, major component was the lamb and minor component was a lot of different spices. So when I was thinking about which wines to pair well that I also know are great, um, great grapes in Virginia, I looked towards Cabernet Franc. I think it's a pretty distinctive red grape that we grow in the state. Um, it's known for its spiciness, specifically a uh, pretty intense black pepper um, aroma. Um, it also has some tobacco notes often that I thought would pair well with that hearty chili type thing. Um, Cab Franc tends to have also a lot of red and black fruit components. So I thought this would be more complimentary, that juicy, jammy sweetness to complement the spice of the dish. The only detriment I could say was that this Cab Franc was probably a little bit high on the tannins for what we would typically do um, for something like a chili. But um, again, you're kind of weighing your options and this seemed like a good one. And she found a great one to try. Other options would have been perhaps Pinot Noir or Chamberson. And I think that's my last slide. So yes, it is. So um, with that, thank you very much. Um, I'll turn it over and uh, uh, welcome any questions. So if you have any questions, you can go ahead and put those in the Q&A box. Um, I am not seeing any at the moment. So we'll just give it one minute in case someone thinks of something. All 
All right, still seeing no questions. So I'm going to assume that everyone, oh, here's oh. one. Um, so the, the question was, could the recipe be shared again? Um, yes, it is actually on our Virginia virtual farm to table page. And I will send out a link to everyone that registered for the Zoom session today. Um, so you can access that quick, uh, easily. Um, so someone is completely new to drinking. What is the best wine type to start with? Yeah, great, um, great question. I would say that most people start with honestly sweet white wines and then slowly progress to drier wines and also heavier bodied moving into the red wines. Um, it's, uh, you can look for like blends, um, like a white blend, that sort of thing. A Riesling would be a really good, if you're, if you're looking for a specific grape variety, I would say Riesling would be a good one to start with. Rieslings tend to be a little bit um, uh, sweet or at least off dry. Um, they're, they're pretty pleasant to, to drink on their own or with food. They pair well with like a lot of Asian or spicy type dishes because of that sweetness and kind of medium bodiedness. Um, and see how you like that. Try some different Rieslings around um, or like very, uh, quote, inoffensive grape types like Pinot Grigio, that sort of thing. Um, as far as then moving into other things, um, Pinot Noir um, is a good entry point for a red wine um, because they're lighter bodied. Um, and depending on where you get it from, for instance, California ones can be pretty jammy, which can be pretty appealing to people. Um, so those would, be, those would be some good places to start. Um, but let me know if if uh, you have any follow up questions on that. All right, so someone else heard that the soil and climate in Virginia is better suited to whites and that's why Virginia doesn't excel in red wines. Is this true? Um, I wouldn't say it is. Um, I think that maybe historically we hadn't found some of the right reds to grow or the right regions to grow our reds, but I mean, a lot of progress has been made in, in the last 30, 40 years. Um, I think we're, we're finding varieties like Cabernet Franc, like Chamberson, um, uh, you know, that, that grow well for us here um, and, and produce something that's unique and good to our region. Um, as far as, yeah, as far as the soil, um, I haven't heard anything about that being better suited to whites. I will say the only reason that I would say that sometimes we, we might skew towards more production, production of more white wine, would be that we tend to harvest our white wine uh, grapes a little bit earlier. Um, the reds, you tend to hang them as long as you can into September and October. And here, climactically, that can be a challenge because we do start to get into hurricane season in different parts of the state or just heavy rainfalls. And that can lead to a lot of disease pressures that can be hard to manage right at the end of the season. So that might be, I think it leads to a slight skewing towards larger quantities of whites. But I think the reds, um, we have some really really delicious examples. Um, if, if you're interested in trying um, kind of a medley of that every year, there is the governor's cup and the governor's case that comes from the governor's cup and they tend to select about six whites and six reds and you can try what are considered some of the flagship wines for that year from the state. Okay, uh, great. All right, that's all the questions I see. So I think, um, oh, no, one more. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay. So what? what yeah, what type of yeast is used? Um, it's typically Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, that's, uh, is that what's in making yeast? Um, I am not sure. Um, I, I do bake a little bit, but um, I just use these yeast packet. Um, yeah, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is, uh, is typically um, the yeast that we inoculate with. Um, it's, uh, tolerant, I wouldn't say resistant, but it's tolerant to higher amounts of ethanol than most other yeast and, and, and most other bacteria. Um, I would say when we talk food safety, the main thing in wine that is going to kill you is the ethanol. Uh, we, due to the low pH and um, the high, in comparison, amounts of ethanol, it's, it's a pretty um, 
uh, low risk for foodborne pathogens. Um, and so due to that, it can be, it can be hard to find an organism to, to carry this through ferment, fermentation wise, but Saccharomyces cerevisiae is kind of a strain that's been selected for, for, for uh, decades or centuries. And so it, it, it does all right. It, it gets the job done. So, yeah. And you can, by the way, I'm sorry, one more thing is you can buy that at like a home winemaking store and such. You can get these little packets of it and such. It's not going to be found at Kroger, like the baking yeast, but it's not super hard to find Cerevisiae. Okay, cool. Um, so I think that's it for the questions. So thank you to all of our presenters today. Um, I hope you all have some inspiration for the weekend. That was certainly a, a nice segue into the weekend. I hope you guys have some fun wine and lamb pairings on, on your kitchen table this weekend. Um, and before you leave, uh, when you close the session, actually you'll get a little pop-up asking you to take a quick survey to give some feedback about the program. So appreciate you taking a, a few moments to do that. Um, but thanks again, everyone, and have a great weekend.